Welcome back to another episode of the Design Build Hunt podcast presented by Whitetail Partners. I'm your host, Josh Raley with Whitetail Partners, Georgia and Georgia, Georgia, whatever I call it. Anyway, Georgia. And uh, on the line with me today, I've got Tim Kaiser from, oh, no, not Ohio. You're in Wisconsin <laughs> and Greg from Ohio. Right. That's what I get for looking around at, uh, at different things here on the screen. So guys, welcome back. Uh, glad we're going to talk a little bit today about a really important topic at this time of year. Uh, and that is FSI, Forest Stand Improvement, improving your your woods for for whitetails, essentially. So uh, it's a little bit different than than maybe the emphasis on TSI, which would be like a timber stand improvement where the number one goal would kind of be uh, promoting the value of the timber, having healthy timber so that we can get some of that uh, revenue off of the landscape, right? And that's actually very, very important for a lot of our landowners. And we want to make sure that we prioritize that for different folks. But when we talk about FSI, there's a little bit of a different emphasis there. Uh, and the emphasis being on wildlife. Um, and then maybe a secondary emphasis when we're talking about it being huntability. So, uh, guys, who wants to jump in first? As we talk about FSI, I'd like to start out with discussing uh, a couple of goals. So maybe what are some of the goals that you're trying to accomplish with FSI on your property or when you're recommending it to, uh, you know, to your clients? Yeah, I, I can jump in here, Josh. And I think the first thing that stands out to me right away is, is when we think about FSI is we're trying to get food to the ground, right? And we're helping those, those deer and the other wildlife by bringing that from, from up in the canopy to down to their level. Uh, and, I, and I think that's important, but I, I think another thing it does that maybe doesn't get talked about as much is we are creating edge and we know deer are edge creatures. And right. so we can use that as kind of a dual purpose. We get food on the ground and we also create an edge that we can use as, as a predictable travel corridor because of it. Right. That's really, really good. And, and for some properties, you know, I'm thinking about me down here in the, in the deep South, we don't have a lot of edge. I mean, we just covered a property uh, here just a second ago on the podcast talking about uh, you know, farm country pinch points, you know, as Greg was highlighting it. And I'm like, there ain't no farm country <laughs> pinch points where I'm at. You know, we, we have to make a pinch point if we want there to be a pinch point a lot of times, but a lot of that is accomplished through FSI. And I know Greg, there are spots in Ohio that are just as big woods and timber country, uh, just like down here in the South. So you deal with a lot of the same thing. So a lot of times you're having to create edge or create pinch points through the use of something like FSI. Greg, why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about what you're, you know, what you're trying to accomplish sometimes when it comes to uh, FSI on a property? Yeah. So you kind of made a, you made a good point there when you brought up the heavily timbered areas that we have here in Ohio. So the interesting thing about the heavily timbered areas here is they're usually accompanied by the really big hills of southern mm -hmm. southeastern Ohio, particularly. And what you're able to do is really enhance uh, deer travel into areas that are perfect for the landowner. So you're able to create that edge in addition to the natural flow of the terrain, which really can condense deer movement into certain areas and create these phenomenal pinch points. Um, so not only are you organizing where exactly there can be some some reason to food on your property in the big woods, but you're also able to really direct that travel to and from that and kind of plan your stand locations accordingly. So it, it that's probably the, the best and most favorite thing that I get to do down in the hills is really kind of connect that travel through FSI. And uh, it's just a great tool to use uh, whenever I'm on a property down in hill country. Yeah. So let's start to dive into this just a little bit. We know FSI is going to be helpful for uh, creating bedding locations where we want our bedding locations, creating travel, creating food opportunities. How are we accomplishing some of these different, maybe big picture goals? Like if you've got a spot, Greg, that you want to be uh, a, you know, a thick bedding area, what, what, what is the, the timber process going to look like there as compared to if you wanted the area to be um, you know, maybe one specifically reserved for a feeding location. Yeah. So it's kind of a delicate process. What I've found, um, 
what I see a lot is that although the deer down in the big timber in the hills, they like to have the security of a bedding area, they also still like to be able to see. So yeah. you are making these bedding areas thicker by nature because if you are somebody that spends a considerable amount of time out in the woods, you know that when you're down in hill country, you'll kick deer up that are bedded next to a blow down, things like that. So you want to kind of resemble the natural bedding habitat the big idea and the big focus is, is you're just making sure that habitat's where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, what I've found down in the Hills is that like, if you're setting up habitat features specifically, the deer are going to use them because they only have so many options in the first place that, uh, you really get to decide how that all plays out. So I think that it, looking at things from the bigger picture, like I might walk around a property a couple times before I even pull the trigger on one decision, because I really want to understand how things are going to connect on the full scale before deciding where we're going to cut for that bedding area. So I think like the big thing, if I'm focusing on a bedding area in the hills is to cut it. So that way it's easily designated as a place that these deer will feel secure, but they're still also able to have that really good visual. Um, so that way you can kind of ensure that they use it. Um, I hope that answered your question. I, I think it did, yes, but I'm not hundred percent positive. Absolutely. <laughs> and we're going to, I want to get into bedding locations more in depth in a future episode. Cause I do get a lot of questions about like, okay, but how do I make deer bed there? It's like, well, you don't, you don't make them. We encourage them to, and, and there are different different scenarios that work in different places, right? Like we're going to do bedding different in the hills of Ohio, like you're saying, than we might, you know, down here in uh, in Georgia. Let's say if I'm in swamp country down in South Georgia, we're going to do that differently there. But Tim, I'm curious how some of what Greg uh, has talked about there with bedding and uh, the way he's setting some of that up. How does that compare with your use of FSI for maybe creating bedding specifically? Yeah. And the first thing I wanted to call out and Greg made a great point there is, is before we're, before we're cutting any trees down, before making improvements is to walk that land and then look at it and then walk it again. Right. And then, and then even go so far as to let's mark some trees and let's look at before we cut a single tree down, let's really look at what we're trying to accomplish and make sure that we're in the right spots and it connects with the rest of our property because we're really excited to get that chance out and start working. And once you cut the tree down, you know, there's no going back. Right. So right. that was a really good call out, Greg. We got to make sure we know exactly what we're doing and it fits with everything else on the property. Yeah. Very, very good point. And, and one thing I want to highlight here is I am talking about FSI, maybe a little differently than some others do. You know, you may look at a property and say, okay, this property mature, closed canopy forest, the whole thing needs FSI. And there's a sense in which that's true. Um, I was on a property last week. We looked over onto the neighbor's ground. And the neighbor's ground had been uh, FSI, right, or uh, timber stand improvement, more likely. But the whole thing had been done essentially in one year. Um, I'm curious from you guys' perspective, what uh, what can that do to and for somebody's hunting? So maybe what are some of the positives that that can bring about if they've just done the whole thing? Um, you know, because some, some will just call like a general for a general reduction. Uh, in in canopy closure, right? They'll say, "Hey, we got to FSI fifty percent on this whole piece of property, right? Opening up fifty percent of the canopy." What are some of the pros and maybe the cons of that big picture approach? Uh, I would I would say that the pros of it are once it's open, you can kind of lay out things as you want. So, like, if you have basically that blank template of there really isn't much here. Uh, you can kind of design, this is where I want my food plots moving forward. This is where I want my bedding areas. And you don't necessarily have to work with what you have because you get to create it. Um, but on the flip side of that, when you do that and you do that mass reduction, uh, you have to wait for your habitat to develop. It's going to take right. some time for that growth to come back. And when you're waiting, uh, you know, it might be a few years before the hunting gets good on your property. I've I've talked with guys that they did that mass reduction and it's been a six, seven year process before the hunting really picked back up. But now, you know, six, seven years down the road, the hunting's phenomenal because it's right. set up absolutely to a T. 
Uh, so that's just the big thing. You know, if it's a property that you're in it for the long term, say it's a property you're buying to hold on to for the rest of your life, that's a great opportunity to do that because that max value approach can get you some money in the bank to get this started, knowing that you are in this for the rest of your life and you're going to have a great place to hunt forever. Where if you're maybe just looking at it for the shorter term, maybe that's not the best approach. And maybe you need to be a little bit more specific on how you want to get that uh, timber taken off your property. Right, right. Yeah, and you can sort of, you can create those voids sometimes when we have these big cuttings. And, and like you said, Greg, it does give you that that blank slate to work with. But if we want to hunt along the way and enjoy it each year, if, if we're clearing several acres, you might all of a sudden create the space where deer really don't want to go through because there's nothing there but some tops that are down. Um, and so there's not, I don't think there's a wrong answer, but I do think that there is a value sometimes to making incremental changes and picking areas each year and being strategic about those changes so that we're not making a radical change to the landscape in one year and pushing deer to an area we don't want, but we're kind of just slowly making improvements toward our end goal. Right, right. That's really good. You know, speaking from a from kind of a southern perspective, so we do a lot of clear cutting, a lot of uh, thinning down here in in some of our pine stands, and we get a really quick response. So by that second or third year, some of these places are going to be head high in brush. You know, after after a significant cutting, and one other thing, you know, you guys are talking about it. It's a longer process. We have such a long growing season here. I mean, my goodness, it's going to be green middle of March, you know, or end of March. Uh, and you guys will be still buried in snow by then. Uh, <laughs> at least the rate things are going. So, um, you know, for us, it is, man, now this whole area is essentially as thick as I would have wanted betting, you know, so, so betting is anywhere and everywhere. And so that can lead to some difficulty with, human and deer interactions if you don't have a good follow-up plan. So I think that's, that's the important takeaway here is if you are going to do one of these, one of these large scale cuttings, reducing the entire canopy across your property, have some kind of follow-up plan for how you are going to continue to manage that, uh, continue to manage what is, what is coming back, the response that you're going to get from mother nature, you, you've got to do something with that, right? You still gotta, gotta hunt that. And, uh, there was actually another, um, there was another property that I was on recently where naturally a lot of the canopy had been reduced. And what happened once that canopy was reduced is the Chinese privet in the bottom was allowed to absolutely flourish. So the invasives were not handled prior to opening up that canopy because it was just kind of naturally done. They didn't do it on purpose. And next thing you know, now it's nothing but Chinese privet down in the bottom. It's totally taken over. And the landowner has a real mess on his hands now trying to get rid of that invasive species that's now crowding, crowding out a lot of desirable plants that he would want to have down there otherwise. So that follow up plan is absolutely huge. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the reasons that guys are a little bit nervous or hesitant, maybe to either cut on their own property or have someone cut on their property. And I know working with different landowners, we've all heard different things. So what are some of the reasons that you have heard where folks are like, mm, I, I really don't want to get into the TSI, FSI thing. I don't want to mess with my timber. I just want to plant some food plots and have some good travel corridors and good locations. I think the the big, for me, the most common objection is just making sure you aren't cutting down the wrong tree. Um, that's like the biggest hesitancy is that guys are right. worried about going out there and cutting down things they're not supposed to. And like we were talking about before we started recording, I believe uh, you only get one chance to cut a tree down. And once it's cut, it's cut. So like there's that installed fear to get this project started where people don't really want to mess up. But that's where we take a lot of phone calls to come in there and help guys out is to kind of make that plan with them. Um, that's definitely the most common objection that I hear, but you know, there's a lot of really good resources out there. Uh, every, every state has its own book that goes over different uh, plants and tree identification. There's apps that you can have on your phone. Now, you know, I have an app on my phone that I take out. And if you really have a question, you can take a picture of a plant or a tree and it's going to tell you what that plant is. So you can definitely learn. Um, and if you are worried about cutting that wrong tree down, just 
go out there, um, use the books, use the apps and just figure it out. And, uh, the beautiful thing is, is that we live in a content age where any question you have can be answered in a few clicks of a button. So I think the big thing is, is if you have that fear of cutting down the wrong tree, just don't be afraid to either ask a question or just go out and look it up because the answer is typically there. Right. Tim, what are some of the resources maybe that you're seeing uh, that are available to folks to, to do that? Like, I, I mean, I'm, you're a landowner yourself, right? So you've got you've got timber cutting happening. So, uh, you know, what are some of the resources that you depend on? Uh, we, we talked before uh, about how you don't have to be a tree expert. And I said, I'm not a botanist. And that has to do with flowers. You corrected me very quickly. Uh, and, and as soon as it came out, I knew it was the wrong word, but I'm no arborist, right? And I'm not a forester and I don't understand every tree out there. I was on a property a couple of weeks ago where uh, we were kind of down in the swamp and uh, I didn't know a tree species. I had no idea what it was. I knew generally that it was some kind of oak. What kind of oak? I don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure. The bark was indistinguishable from, from a couple of others. It's like, okay, this is just kind of a generic looking oak tree. I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, so I'm no professional when it comes to, to the, the, uh, tree classification. So what are some of the resources that you've seen and that you're making use of? Yeah, I'm in the same camp as you, Josh. Uh, I'm still learning a lot of this. And so number one, a couple things Greg mentioned, I'm carrying around a little book, a little tree identification book. Every time I'm going on a property with a client, we don't have to know everything. We just need to have something that can help tell us. There's apps that are great too. Uh, but another resource I wanted to call out is talk to your county forester. A lot of times they're willing to come out on the property with you, spend a couple hours out there. You can ask them questions. They're going to give you a lot of information on the native species. And no one's going to know the area that you're living in better than somebody who does that professionally. So don't be afraid to give them a call. That's what they're there for. Um, I did that on my property right when we bought it, and it was fantastic. We learned so much uh, very quickly, and it helped educate and inform a lot of our decisions that we're still making. Right. And that's such a big uh, such a boost there. You know, there are uh, private foresters who are going to make their money based off of, you know, timber sale on your property. There are consulting foresters who you are going to have to pay a fee to when they show up because they're basically going to act as a consultant on your property. And then there's the state forester where you've got to get on their schedule. And I don't know your experience, Tim, but it, it may take them a while to get out there, but you will not regret it. And they will be more than happy to walk the property with you, identify trees for you, which take some flagging tape, wrap it around the tree, write the name of that tree on there. You can return. And I always tell people, find the top 10 trees on your property and learn those 10. If you learn those 10, then you're good to go. But there are seldom properties that I'm like, wow, there's such a diversity of trees here. You can never learn them all. You know, for most properties that I see, and, and you guys can can jump in if, if you've got a different experience, but for most properties that I'm on, if people would learn their top 10 trees, 95% of their forestry needs are going to be met, you know, or by, or they're, they're at least going to be able to figure that out uh, just on those, those top 10. And, and your local forester who is a state or county employee can help you out on that. Now, like I said, you do have to get on their schedule, but you don't have to worry, you know, in that instance about whether or not, you know, they're either going to have to charge you or whether or not you're going to, they're going to be making their their paycheck comes from encouraging you to cut what you can off of your property, you know, essentially for like a, for like a private forester, but yeah, foresters are great resources, no matter what, um, no matter what, what way that you have, that you have to, to get them out onto your property and figure out, uh, how they can help. So, uh, anything else guys, when it comes to maybe just setting goals, big picture FSI, we're going to dive more into this over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. I would say to understand what, what your goals are, whether that's if you're talking with the county forester, like we just talked about, whether it's you're meeting with one of us on a property is, is what do you want, right? And, and, and communicate those objectives because uh, this is a good example for me. Uh, when we're doing hinge cutting on a property, I'm like, let's take these maples down. They're gonna sprout. This is a good, good resource. And my dad loves to, to make maple syrup. And so he's like, let's leave all these big, beautiful sugar maples up, right? So for one yeah. person, that's a really valuable tree. They want that on their property. You tell your forester that, you know, point these out to me. Where can we, you know, help these trees mature? Other people see that same maple and they say, it has no value to the deer. Let's get it on the ground. Um, and so any of these things, I think you always have to look through the scope of what is important to you and what your objectives are, because that's different to everyone. Right. And that's where I would say, you know, if you are considering having one of us out to your property, 
do that early on in, in the process so that we can uh, ascertain some of those goals so that we can give you options as to, you know, how your property may be best designed and set up so that then you can sort of answer the question of what am I going to cut down on the back end of that as you really dial in that piece? Because, uh, you know, if it's if it's a spot where you want your prime bedding area where well, you, you and your dad might have to have a discussion about those maples, right? I mean, it, right. There, there may need to be a conversation going on there, but if it's in an, if it's in an off, off the, the core of the property spot, not a big deal. Didn't really know what to do. Yeah, man, leave all the maples there that you want dad tap away. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, be good with syrup, which what's that syrup season is uh, about two months away for you guys right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's Around right. About. It's coming up. Man, it's yep. one of my one of the coolest things that I've done was was when I was living in Wisconsin, watching people uh, make maple syrup. I had a friend that did it every year. I think he had like fifty trees in his yard. Um, that was just perfect for for making some maple syrup. So, uh, all right, guys, anything else regarding FSI TSI timber work? Now's the time. So we want to get you guys ready. Next time we're going to talk about uh, mistakes that folks make and maybe answer some of those questions. But uh, anything else? Not that I'm my end. No, I All think right. you covered it. Cool. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me for this episode, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you would, head over to our YouTube channel. You can watch us in person if you're just listening to this episode. And we've got a bunch of other content coming out there as well.